welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guests are Joanne Yates, Sloan Distinguished Professor of Management at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Craig N. Murphy, the Betty Freyhoff Johnson Professor of Political Science at Wellesley College. We will discuss their book, Engineering Rules, Global Standard Setting Since 1880, which is published by Johns Hopkins University Press. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's so great to have you on. Um, I really enjoyed reading your book and participating in the symposium that was organized around it. Um, and I'm so glad that uh, our mutual friend, Emily Bremer, uh, connected me with the both of you. We, we're glad too. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, so for listeners who might not be so familiar with standard setting and standard setting organizations. I wonder if you could start by just talking a little bit about why, what standards are and why standards are important. So standards are actually documents. They are either digital or paper documents that lay out the specifications for a product or a process. And the reason they're important is because without standards, most of the things we use every day wouldn't work. The internet wouldn't work. We wouldn't be able to have electrical systems that connect across the world. We wouldn't even be able to have uh, water and sewer coming into our house without specifications for how all the little parts of the system are to be connected. So maybe to make it a little bit more concrete, you could provide like an example of a particular kind of standard that people might be familiar with or experience the consequences of it in their everyday life and then kind of explain a little bit about where the people implementing the standard or following the standard would find it and understand what the standard is. Well, the one of the most important ones right now is the standard for containers, those big boxes that go on ships, and especially the, the standard that uh, provides little corners of them that make sure they can all be stacked and go from one place to another. And the reason that that's important is because we wouldn't have a global manufacturing economy without that. The containerization system actually lowered costs of manufacturing and shipping them across the world so much that it's the major reason probably why so many of our, the things that we use here in the United States today are actually manufactured in China. Whereas before the standard was set, in the 60s and 70s, um, those the port costs associated with moving things around were so prohibitive that it wasn't possible to have a global manufacturing system. Hmm. So, so how did that happen? Like, how do how did a standard like the standard for containerization come to pass? And how would someone making or using a container know where to look or understand what the standard they have to abide by actually is? So the container standard is a very interesting story. Back in the 1950s, before anyone had um, thought about standards for it, there were two American companies that actually realized that there, for their own purposes, an internal standard, a proprietary standard, would reduce their costs. So instead of having to have the longshoremen load and unload every single item out of the hold of a ship, they could pack it all into one of these boxes and then transport the, the box on the ship and then put the box onto a railroad. But, but standards for individual companies aren't revolutionary. Right. And there's an organization called the American National Standards Institute that decided to hold a standard setting meeting. And that's really what or the book is mostly about, these standard setting or organizations and then the technical committees that have these meetings and the meeting like all of, of the standard setting meetings included representatives of the companies that makes the things in this case the standard containers and representative of the companies that use them in this case shippers uh, rail companies uh, trucking companies and that sort of thing as well as engineers who were uh, supposed to represent the public at large, the general interest. And they sat around for years in little committee meetings, um, working on developing standards for the size of the containers, the nature of those corners, 
all of the things associated with that, and then writing them down into on on into documents that could then be purchased uh, by anybody who wanted to manufacture a container or wanted to use the containers on on their ship. And in this case, the um, the standard started at in ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, but it then immediately um, moved into the international arena at ISO and the the International Organization for Standardization. And so ISO based its international standard for containers on the American one, although it... There was another iteration of standardization right. uh, committee meetings, which included people from the same industries of the rest of the world before the, the original standard, which has been updated a number of times since then, uh, was, was established at a global level. So the subtitle of your book is Global Standard Setting Since 1880. Uh, and I was wondering, why 1880? I mean, why is that an important moment? Is that when standardization started to emerge or did it change some at that point? And sort of why, yeah. why did people start standardizing uh, in the first place? Yeah. So, so let me talk about the time frame for a minute. During the uh, early and middle 19th century, engineers were professionalizing in the industrial companies, countries, excuse me. And when they professionalized, they felt like they needed to um, have something that they could do that was for the public good, because professionals typically have some aspect of their, uh, their um, identities that, that serves the public good. So standardization was what they came up with. So initially there were a few attempts to standardize things just within individual professional associations. But it, it, starting in the 1880s, we start to see larger organizations um, to create standards. The, during the 1880s, 80s, the first international standardization for building materials, um, that organization for testing building materials was was established. It didn't survive. So the first surviving organizations were really started around 1900, but these initial attempts started around 1880. And for our purposes, the real key thing that happened in the 1880s is the process that is now the standard process used by all these different organizations, a process of having engineers representing the major producers of the product or service, engineers who are representing the major companies that consume it, purchase it originally, and then a third set of engineers representing the uh, common interest. It, that process was invented in the 1880s. Right, so it, it was invented, it started being invented by the, the, the international organization that didn't survive and also by some of the individual um, uh, engineering associations, but 1900 is when we finally get a move towards organizations that are that created last. that last and are created solely for setting standards. The first of which was the British National Standards Institution. Mm. So, when industries, companies, organizations started engaging in these kinds of standard setting enterprises. Were there particular standards efforts that were more or less successful than others? And, you know, what do you think kind of was driving success or failure in efforts to, to create and adopt standards? So the, er, some early successes were things like railroad ties, um, Standards for steel railroad rails. Rails. Sorry, uh, rails. And uh, it was probably the most important thing, and the adoption of that process from one industry to another uh, is a lot of how we ended up with a kind of snowballing effect by the, the early part of the 20th century. Yes. So after the UK created the first of the national standards bodies, there was a there was a whole series of other countries that imitated it starting right around world war one and during and after world war one copied how the british did it and set up their own national bodies and at at the same time 
the engineers involved in standardization sort of became a social movement. They became people who were deeply convinced that what they were doing, having this kind of voluntary consensus uh, process of establishing standards, was something that was going to save the world. Yeah, they, they actually were quite utopian in their <laughs> beliefs about it. They thought it would save their national economies initially, but then as the international bodies grew up, starting with the International Electrotechnical Commission, which was founded in 1906 and still exists and functions today. So with that... Um, they started to talk about peace as well as prosperity. Like world peace. And, and uh, save, you know, uh, saving materials, which might we now might say was something that looks like saving the environment. I mean, they, they, the engineers involved in this movement were deeply committed, and they were deeply committed to eventually having international or universal standards. So a lot of the leaders of this movement kind of went around the world and tried to convince people in other countries that they needed national standardization organizations and that all of the national standardization organizations should work together and cooperate. And it was a really strange movement in some ways because it worked across the uh, divides in the First World War. There was still uh, at least knowledge and cooperation between, say, the British and, and the Germans. Uh, and then there was immediately after the Russian Revolution, the standardizers in the major capitalist countries were all running over or trying to help the folks in the Soviet Union start a good Soviet National Standards Bureau that would help all peace and prosperity and all of those sorts of things in the Soviet Union. And after World War II, there was another um, attempt to pull back in all of the enemy combatants. Uh, the, the, the allies tried to to pull in the uh, enemy combatants and and to keep the Cold War from pushing the, the Soviet Union out. So there was a great effort. The, the standardizers all believed that every country had to be involved and that they were they should be above politics, international politics, in doing this standards work. And, and some of the standardizers worked with the United Nations to provide technical assistance to almost every developing country in order to create national standardization organizations everywhere in the world. My favorite one is actually BOBS, the Botswana Bureau of Standards. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think the source of that utopianism in the early standards movement was? And, and does it persist today or is that something that was part of that historical moment? and is no longer as salient yeah. today. So I think in part, it, engineers, you know, a, as engineers professionalized, they became very proud of their role in the world. They thought that, and some people even argued that they were what kept um, civilization, separated civilization from barbarism. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, there, was a, there was pride in, the, in their professional work, the sense that engineering broadly understood was contributing to uh, the transformation of society in positive ways. And the fact that they had been successful in international cooperation, particularly around the First World War, um, while governments were doing terrible things like blowing each other up, um, made that that sense even stronger. Today, yes, there is a continuing feeling among many people involved and the engineers involved in standardization that they're doing something that is of uh, the great social good. But since about the 1980s, most of the new standardization efforts are kind of, if there's a social mission, it's a mission to achieve the end, like uh, maintaining the internet or maintaining the World Wide Web. It's actually the, not the standardization per se, but the object that is being created by the standardization. But it's still kind of a social movement. And, and that social movement we also see in standards being set around environmental uh, goals and corporate social responsibility. But again, the, the movement um, energy is no longer attached to standardization per se. It's attached to the, the specifics of what they're trying to standardize. 
Mm. Do you get the impression historically or today as well that some industries are more or less susceptible to the effective implementation of standardization? And do you get the impression that, you know, the success of standardization is dependent upon the sort of dynamics of an industry? Or as you observed earlier, is it more of like a political kind of quasi political question where like it really depends on whether good kind of practices in standard setting are developed are adopted you know i don't think we have done enough research to definitively answer the, those, those questions but we certainly notice that um the standardization is, throughout its history throughout the, since the 1880s the people who were the most involved kind of the most concerned about the the movement tended to be in the newest industries of the era so that's you know like the electrical industry, which uh, which was uh, very important at, at uh, in the early years, as as well as uh, material science and and chemistry. So newer industries, perhaps, it might be one thing. Um, does the industry matter? Maybe the new the newer industry thing does. Um, yeah, and, yeah. I, I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, I do think newer industries, there's more enthusiasm around standardizing for them. But the irony and, and the potential problem that we face today is that there are a lot of areas that still really need standardization and there's less enthusiasm among engineers for doing it. I think one of the things that was true in the early era is engineers who were quite important you know were the chief engineers of their companies or even the ceos of their companies took part in the standardization process and i think that helped them reach some very good standards when now i think a lot of the people who do standards are not placed as highly in their companies and in some of the older industries it's hard to get people to replace um, older the generation. older generation. I, I just noticed today, I was looking up on the IEEE site, the, the Electrical Engineering Association, which does a lot of standardizing. It, it, it's top um, standards, the top selling standards are in this area called electromagnetic compatibility. It's, it's the standard. Radio interference. Right. It's the, the standards that help, that keep all our devices from interfering with each other. and it's incredibly important to our world, but it's an old area of of study. We have a chapter on it in the 60s through the 1980s in the book, and the old, very old um, individuals who are uh, retiring and dying were have complained to us that it's hard to get the younger generation to join these efforts. That, and and it's not just in in a field like that. I I was visiting China a couple of years ago for a conference on standardization, and there were two groups of standardizers of themselves in in the city where I was at Changsha, and one group of them were the standardizers in the fireworks industry, which is actually <laughs> one of its centers is, is Changsha, and they were all old men. And then there were the people who were working on, uh, you know, cell phones and that sort of stuff. And they were all a much more diverse group of real young people. And so, you know, that, that's kind of a, a problem. They, they both, both sets of people really deeply believed in standards, actually. But uh, the aging in the older industries was a bit of a, is a bit of an issue. Mm. Are there areas of industry practice today where you think standards or more robust standards might be especially helpful or valuable where they haven't uh, been adopted or haven't been developed? And if so, why do you think that might be? So the first thing that <laughs> pops into my mind is actually, uh, so with the, with internet connections of various sorts. So the, the ongoing problem of companies like Apple, who, and Apple likes its own proprietary standards. It's trying to make that a competitive advantage, and it refuses to, to adopt many voluntary standards. So uh, 
that creates the many incompatibilities and then the growing emergence of, of workarounds to make us all compatible anymore. Um, so there are particular companies that can take a position that causes problems. Companies that, that have large market share for you know one reason or another uh, would like it like Apple and that that don't actually like to get into this business. Although for, you know for giant sectors where standardization doesn't take place, oh I don't know. I guess we're less perhaps less concer concerned about that. I guess I'm I nothing pops to mind in terms of the whole sector. Well, no wait a minute. Uh, they're trying to to standardize in the security areas, groups like the World Wide Web Consortium, like the Internet Engineering Task Force, are working on encryption standards and, and standards like that, but there's still more need in, in for some, better ones. In some of the service fields, uh, like doing back office work, it's a, standardization is, is a new thing, and uh, there's an expectation among uh, a lot of the standard setters in, in the business that once some of the things that are currently go, uh, you know, being discussed in ISO standards committees, that uh, some of the incompatibilities, say between the software that, that does uh, back office things in one part of the world and another will all disappear. So that's, a, that's probably another area where the standardization is going to be helpful, but the standardization is starting to go on at this point. Mm. Um, so, sorry, continue. I think there's a certain, uh, at least traditionally, what the belief of these standardizers was that there should be a demand for a standard, that standardization shouldn't happen until there are uh, manufacturers and users who want a standard, or for whom a standard would be helpful. And, and there have been lots of problems with the opposite, you know, with, with attempts to anticipate uh, change and then creating anticipatory standards that just don't work or else kind of take you down a rat hole in, in, in one direction or another. I, I think we've become, uh, as we've looked over, over the lo longer history, we're probably not uh, great supporters of the idea that just creating standards that, uh, because they might be possible uh, is, has really proven to be a, wor a worthwhile thing. I mean, it's certainly the case that we've had a lot of wasteful standards wars, like with the DVDs and uh, you know the Blu-ray, Blu but uh, uh, that, that that sort of thing more recently. But it was also the case that maybe, at least at the very beginning. Uh, the technologies weren't quite ready for for, for a standardization. Yeah. So let me, what what Craig just said um, made me uh, think that I, I should lay out another uh, framework for thinking about standard setting that might be useful to your listeners. If we th think about standardization on a continuum, at one end of the continuum is the standards war, where you know, it's just companies duking it out and trying to win in the marketplace. So it's all in the market. The other end of that continuum is government regulation. The government setting, setting a standard and making it a regulation. And the world that we're studying in this book is in between those two. It's a, a private organizations that are voluntarily, the engineers who work through them are volunteering and the um, the standards that are set are voluntarily adopted by companies. Of course, in some cases it becomes <laughs> in many cases. Yeah, it becomes so so um, universally adopted that companies can't avoid it uh, if they're gonna make money. But but in general the notion is that these are voluntary. Now there is sort of a, a gray area that occurs between the government regulations and the voluntary standards, which is where governments um, point to standards in legislation. Uh, and they become essentially obligatory at, 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 at that point. 
or even just because the government is a purchaser and in, in legislation says, you know, if you're going to sell to us, you have to, to abide by these standards. But governments are really terrible at setting standards. I mean, they, they're, democratic governments tend to not even want to do it because somebody's always hurt if the standard is set. And governments rarely have the, the expertise to set standards in, in new fields. So there's kind of a reason why government standard setting isn't wonderful. The market standard setting um, is frequently wasteful because of, because of the standards wars. So there's kind of a, a, a reason for the existence of the, these organizations in this middle realm. And I think one of the things that probably interests us the most when we were doing this research is that the realm is not um, studied as much as perhaps it should be. And you know, we have lots of people who study government, we have lots of people who, who study the market, but very few people who actually study this middle realm where a lot of the interesting work is going on. Let me make one other distinction on types of standards that government versus private uh, organizations make. The, the area where government does make more, um, stand, set more standards has to do with safety. So things that are very safety oriented, the government is more willing to get involved in. Including food safety and, and safety of machinery. And in some ways, environmental standards are, are essentially like safety standards. And they are safety standards, ultimately. But interoperability standards, that's what almost exclusively happens through these voluntary standard setting. Everything from making screws, nuts and bolts compatible so that you can replace one when you um, strip the threads on a screw um, to uh, things on your internet connections. Those, all those interoperability standards are much more likely to be, be determined within these voluntary standards organizations. Mm. Well, one of the observations I thought was really interesting in your book was the extent to which particular individuals and their personalities can have an effect on the kind of success of standardization efforts and the shape that those efforts take. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on sort of where you saw that happening and why you thought that was an important factor. Well, you know, there's, there is a a quote that we have somewhere in the middle of the book where, where the wife of the long-term head of the ISO, uh, Nolly Stern, says that reflecting on her long career knowing standardizers, she could never figure out whether standardization is a field where nice people are attracted or whether taking part in standardization makes you nice. <laughs> and I think a lot of the cases that we've talked about where there are people who are, whose personalities are central to good standards coming out, these are people who are uh, diplomatic, uh, long-suffering in some cases because they're willing <laughs> to sit in these meetings forever and ever, uh, quite, quite technically uh, astute in one way or another uh, in, in a particular form, often internationalist and, and able to speak multiple languages or at least not have difficulty with people from, from uh, different societies. I mean, there are all of these kinds of qualities. Um, and yeah, I, those things really matter, but they may be things that people learn over many, many years of engaging in standardization if they don't have them at, at the beginning. I think it's also the case that people who don't have them in the beginning and who don't have the capacity to learn them uh, quickly drop quickly drop out you know they just don't do very well in it um, and you know the the ones who are successful at at chairing these committees for example and at pushing standards forwards forward they all the ones that we um, looked at closely who were in that role did have this quality of being able to uh, be diplomatic, to let other people take credit for things, to, to not, um, uh, not exacerbate the differences, but try to find ways to bridge over the differences. And they all had, and almost all of them, had very great technical skills. 
Donald Trump is kind of the exact opposite. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Mm. Uh, you might you might want to cut that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, of all the potential criticisms of Donald Trump, that one strikes me as relatively mild. <laughs> not a good standard setter. No, not a good standard setter. No, no. <laughs> actually, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover had all those skills, though. Actually. And he was very important in standard setting before he uh, became president. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he, he had the technical skills. He he was had the uh, the judicious ability to listen to other people and to respond to objections and all of those sort of things. So it's not a question about being a Republican. <laughs> so one of the one of the pieces built of, of the process that's built into it in the traditional standard setting bodies is something that we started calling due process. What it meant was when you if you sent out a ballot and had people vote on a draft standard and you know, a bunch of them agreed, but there were two or three that didn't agree, and they put their complaints on the ballot, what they didn't agree with yet, what they couldn't live with. Instead of just letting the majority rule, what happens in each case is that the, there's a small committee who goes through every single objection and answers, and answers it and says, okay, we could do this, we could change the, the standard, the draft in this way to take care of that objection, or we could... Um, in, in some ways, we, we could propose an alternative in here, or we could try to talk to this person to see if there's a way uh, that the person's concerns could be satisfied differently. And they would go through, and then they would make, they would make these giant tables of you know, their response to each of them, send them back around to the whole committee. The whole committee would look at them all again. They would go through a whole bunch of iterations and they would come up with a new draft that incorporated as many as they could and they would send that new draft out so rather than and then the same thing happens again so at every point every objection has to be considered and considered the the ideal and what they attempt to to achieve is that everyone either agrees or is okay with it can live with it you know, as long as there are people actively disagreeing, the traditional model said you, says you don't close the standard. You keep trying to make it better. So, you know, there's a, <laughs> this requires an incredible amount of patience on the part of the people running the process. They have to be willing to uh, engage in this ongoing dialogue, and it can be years of it, years and years of it. So it, it does require a certain uh, personality type. And set of skills. I mean, you know, yeah. Right. Skills and, you know, ability not to explode over yet another objection mm. uh, uh, to be able to do that process. So I think the chairs of committees in particular, yeah. in particular have to have those skills to, to, and only people who have them, I think, rise to be, um, chairs at, at, at higher and higher levels. Well, I, in closing, I, I got to say that reading your book, it really struck me as in some ways, like almost a story about a particular kind of deliberative democracy and how it seems yeah. to work really effectively. Yeah. And I wonder if you think that the kind of the story of standard setting has anything to tell us about the democratic process more broadly and ways we might think about making it work better. Uh, I, this is Craig, the political scientist of the group, and I, I think it really does. I'm not sure that that's what I anticipated when we started doing this research. But it really tells us a lot about how um, we shouldn't be satisfied with majoritarian rule. We should be expecting more of ourselves, more of a willingness in democratic societies to uh, develop deliberative processes and work through them. Now, the Swiss are probably better at this than... Uh, people in any other democratic society. I know that, and I know some of the political scientists who study the, uh, this kind of democracy uh, empirically tend to be Swiss, and maybe we should kind of uh, see if we can all adopt some of those things ourselves. 
I must say, at the at the moment, our political, the U.S. political system is not oriented that way. But I don't think anyone is terribly happy about it. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's lovely. I'll have to be in touch with all of my Swiss relatives in Basel shortly. They'll be pleased to hear that. Oh, they're excellent! Involved. A very good standardization city, you know. Yes. <laughs> excellent. Well, Craig, Joanne, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's been a real pleasure talking to you about your really excellent book. Thank you. Thank you. We've really enjoyed it. just sang is what we'll use to get back into the live show. But that show isn't just going to be songs. No, sir. We're also going to do a dramatic scene. 